Oh, it says starting record. Okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. We are here. The Kakuzians, <laughs> the Kakuzians have, have, have reunited. We've we've reassembled the Avengers. Um, I have Aramarata, who is back in uh, Aotearoa after visiting us here on Turtle Island. Uh, so I saw Arama here at York, actually, Carl, uh, just, what, two days ago, three days ago? Uh, it's yeah. a blur, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we have Carl Za, uh, otherwise known as Mr. Canada, back from his globe, I mean, not Mr. Canada, Mr. America, Mr. America, back from his globe trotting. He's frozen now, but he'll be back, I'm sure. Um, back from his globe trotting, he was in, I think, the United States of America. He was on the mothership. Um, Carl, are you there? Can we get you? I'm back. Okay. I'm back to Earth. Okay, back good. Back to Bali. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, Carl, your 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 picture is frozen. I don't know how how much that'll affect us, but I'm not going to worry about it right now. We'll um, we'll um, we'll deal with it as we go. So you know, I wanted to reassemble the Kakuzians. Uh, not because of any particular caucus type of news. In fact, I, I wanted to get you guys back to talk Palestine um, because I think between you, we have, I don't know, we have an interesting, I think we have interesting things to add to this discussion that are not otherwise um, discussed. And so, um, Arama, I actually wanted to start with you because, you know, I watched you, you spoke um at a at, at a rally and you were relating um Palestine uh to some of the uh wars that that the Maori fought uh against uh colonization uh by England um by Anglo colonizers and I just thought that was so important and I thought that was such an important uh thing to to talk about, which is like, this is like, everybody's talking about this in like military analysts are analyzing this as like, a kind of like, oh, like Russia, Ukraine, everybody's had Russia, Ukraine on their minds. And so they're like, you know, looking at the firepower on both sides, and looking at the equipment on both sides and, uh, and coming to certain conclusions about who's going to win, <laughs> which is like when you analyze a war that way. Um, but it's also it's also it's a, also a guerrilla war, which is why I wanted Carl. I wanted to I invite you, Carl. But then it's also a settler indigenous colonial war, which is why I wanted to invite you, Arama. So I just kind of want to give you the floor to talk about the land wars um, uh, in uh, Aotearoa and uh, and and some of that history that you, you know. I want to give you a chance to go into more depth than you did at that talk. <laughs> Yeah, well, it was quite interesting when um, when that rally took place. So that was on the 14th of October. It was actually the day that we were having a general election as well. Um, and at that point, um, the organisers were still being, I guess, a little cautious, I think. I didn't want to kind of introduce um, a discussion or talking points that um, people were not ready for because you kind of have to bring people along. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what the media were presenting was the story about this um, attack or invasion or incursion as though it was entering somebody else's land and that all these atrocities were committed. You know, we didn't have much analysis around how many of the people who died were combatants. We didn't have information on how many were killed by um, the IDF at that point. Um, so all we were being told was that all these atrocities had been committed, that this was a terrorist act. Um, and so, you know, I guess all we could really do at that time was kind of demand a ceasefire. Um, but I wanted to talk about what was happening there without talking about what was happening there. Um, yeah. And so I did that by just talking about our own history in Aotearoa. Um, and, you know, the fact that um, I guess also just, just being really clear about this being a settler colonial situation, a, an mm -hmm. occupation with an indigenous people and, and a, a colonizer, uh, because so often we're, I guess the, the media is trying to present this as really nuanced and, and um, different claims about who, who um, is entitled to live in that territory. So I just wanted to kind of cut through that really clearly. And once you put it into those terms, there's a lot of um, support in Aotearoa for decolonization um, and Indigenous struggles. And so uh, putting it in those terms obviously kind of cuts through a lot of that. Um, and I have to um, shout out you, Justin, because your book, Siege Breakers, was... Um, 
really influential to me in terms of understanding kind of the situation that people in Gaza are facing. Um, when you handed it to me, I was nervous because I was like, oh, God, this is someone's <laughs> first novel. Um, <laughs> vanity, vanity project, yeah. <laughs> yeah and I, was like, I, I, I love the podcast. You're my favorite podcaster that does not. Sorry, Carl. <laughs> but the algorithms really shadow bound you, so I just haven't been, uh, <laughs> been able to see you much lately. <laughs> so I haven't been able to uh, follow as much. But um, but yeah, yeah, no, the book was actually brilliant. Um, I don't usually like novels, but I love Siege Breakers. And so, um, yeah, we also put out a... Um, I wrote like a I wrote a piece that I would usually get accepted into um, a, like magazine type um, publication here, but they're like too nervous to publish it. So my friend put it on her blog, but I use the term siege breakers in that. And um, yeah, if you haven't read siege breakers, you should you should check it out, even though it needs a sequel now because they they broke the siege. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what what I talked about was um, just some of the kind of key points that um, I thought that the Palestinian community could relate to, and that is propaganda. So, you know, they made up all these lies about um, our people and the threat that we pose to settler society, um, and they used that. Um, what they actually did is they issued a statement saying that we had to swear allegiance to the crown or they would invade our land, but they didn't even wait for a reply. It was just all, you know, part of the um, justification they wanted to provide. So they issued this. Um, so you, you had to recognize, you had to recognize the crown. You had to recognize yeah. the crown yeah. and, and it's right to exist. Uh, it's right <laughs> to the land. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it's the same so kind they, of extortion. Yeah. So they issued that and then didn't wait for a reply. They just immediately invaded. Um, and there was a battle at Rangiriri where our, because our women and children were sometimes in fortified pa and, oh, sorry, fortified positions. And um, uh, the the colonial forces said, oh, this is, this is not how we do things. This is uncivilized. You can't have your women and children there. So we moved them all to a place called Rangiriri, and it was understood that this was where our non-combatants would be. This would be for our elderly, for our wounded, for our women and children. And it was also like a, a bread basket, so it was a place that we were growing a lot of food. Um, and after the Battle of Rangiriri, they went around our defensive line straight to that sanctuary and massacred people there, um, you know, including in uh, a group of people who were, who were in a place of worship, praying, Christian place of worship, um, praying. And, um, yeah, one of my ancestors was able to, and they set buildings on fire with people still in them. Um, one of my ancestors, uh, Hungi Hungi Kapere, was able to, like, break um, break a portion of the wall at the back of the church Um and he and a, he rescued a child and and um yeah so that's our connection to that um massacre at Rangialfia um and then uh, we had the battle of Orako uh, which followed that and in that battle our women and children were back in the fortified positions um and they asked us to surrender after uh, we were under siege for three days without food or water, uh, where we were using peach pips in our rifles because they um, we'd run out of bullets, and they asked us to surrender. And um, yeah, our leader Rewi Maniapoto said, "Kafafai tonu mato ake ake ake, we will fight you forever and ever and ever." And then um, after that, they said, "Well, at least put, you know, at least um, release the women and children, um, and we will take them as prisoners." And uh, one of our um, chiefs. Um, stood up and said, if the men die, the women and children will die too. And then they fought their way out and many people died, but our leader, Riwi Maniapoto, and many others um, survived. And so those were just things that I thought would kind of resonate um, with, with the community who were hurting at that time. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I love that speech. I listened to that. Uh, you, you sent, uh, Adama, Carl, Adama sent me a video of that speech and every once in a while. <laughs> I, I listen. I just watch it. I pull it out. Watch it. Ah, um. So Carl, I wanted to bring you in, <laughs> um, because you know I've I've actually seen some of the military analysis that you've done, and I don't think people have been asking you the right questions actually, because it's like a guerrilla war is different, right? And it's like, um, and some of the best theorists, well, you know, one of the theorists that everybody knows of guerrilla war, uh, is of course Mao. And so I wanted to kind of ask you, and I, I know you know about the Vietnam War too. So it's like, there is a theory of people's war. Um, and, you know, I, like, 
I just kind of want to give you a bunch of time to talk about people's war, the theory of it, the practice of it, how it worked, how costly it is, how devastating it is, but like ultimately how it may not be like, like the humanitarian catastrophe doesn't necessarily mean that the Palestinians are losing because a war, a people's war is a different kind of war. And so I just wanted to kind of ask you about that, that, that kind of well, concept. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we're having this conversation because just a couple of days ago, Elon Musk tweeted out that he said decolonization from the river to the sea and similar euphemism necessarily imply <laughs> genocide. Yeah, so we right. are actually here promoting genocide. Apparently. A mosque. We're, yeah. we're, we're promoting genocide of stupid ideas. Right? <laughs> there are lots of stupid ideas out there. And, and, and the idea that, yeah. uh, you know, a people who face the overwhelming uh, military superiority of the enemy must fight on their enemy terms. I mean, th this is what American playing about Vietnamese during Vietnam War. So, oh, they don't fight fear, fair. They don't, they don't come out in the open and let us blast them with our superior air power, right? I mean, they hide among civilians. This is not the rule of engagement. I mean, of course, what they're saying, when they say not fight fair, they, they're talking about they don't let Americans use their technological advances to, to wipe them out. I mean, same, same thing is happening to in, in Palestine right now, and, and and same thing happened back then as Aroma related to when European talking about their rule of, of welfare. Welfare, it's it's on the on the terms that will be advantage uh, advantageous to them. Uh, you know, th there's only one rule in, in the welfare: you, you fight to win, right? I mean, this, there's no this, there's no this, there, you do whatever is necessary to win, and and in, in situations like is like Palestine, like like uh, or or during the, the Second World War II or when uh, the Chinese guerrillas are fighting the Japanese occupation army, you don't want to fight on your enemy's terms. You will get wiped out. You 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 do you 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 use the terrain, you use your knowledge of uh, your community of the uh, of your, your 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 human intelligence on the ground. And and then all these talk about how they fight, fight unfair, how they use uh, supposedly use human shields. I mean, it's it's really facetious. And uh, and, and now we, we know a lot of that is actually propaganda. You know, now now there's more there's more reporting coming out about what happened October seventh. There's report that. Israel gunship just led up 200 of their own people, you know, they because they didn't bother to verify whether they're uh, Palestinians or Israelis. They just uh, they were just shooting to kill and and which verify what we some of the images we have seen coming out. You know, some of the more careful observers says there's no way the Hamas had that kind of firepower. Um, you know that, that you know some of the cars look like they've been flattened by tanks and. And, and and now we know all these uh, instances of people being burned alive because they were uh, they had bombs and uh, dropped on by the Israelis. Um, and 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 again, the, 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 sometimes they come up with some outrageous lies to the point I think um, they don't really care anymore. They, mm. I think most people who say. Uh, stuff like from river to the sea is a slogan for genocide. I don't think most people who say that even believe that themselves. I think they yeah. are, this is just their way to climb, clamp down on dissent. They're cracking down on what's acceptable speech, you know, like like uh, Elon Musk is doing. He, he's saying like, just by saying decolonization from river to, to the sea will get you deplatform on um, Twitter. Of course, what he is doing is he's, he's covering his own ass because different advertisers are now threatening to pull out of Twitter. Um, you know, that that's that's all that's the bottom line he care about. And um but we you know I, I okay I I I'm I'm going off I may have been going off a little bit on tangent. So I rely on it's not a tangent. It's not a tangent. It's more like having to kind of uh there's like a co there's always like a cobweb of the current news and the latest uh outrageous things. And it's like we kind of have to talk about them first. 
in order to get down to business. I mean, I, I also, the, I also, while we're at that, while we're on that, the the, the IDF uh, released footage today of like um, some of the captives, uh, the hostages in the hospital, and they're like, "See, we told you they were they brought captives to the hospital," and it's like, "Yeah." They brought wounded people <laughs> to the hospital. That's what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to destroy the hospital. You're supposed to bring the wounded people to the hospital. And that's part of why humanitarian law supposedly protects hospitals. Of course, humanitarian law doesn't protect anything, um, as and, we have seen. Speaking of which, they, uh, you know, one of the Israeli spokes, IDF spokesperson referred to World War II, you know, firebombing of Dresden and yeah. Tokyo and Japanese cities and say, hey, see, you know, this is the same type of actions Allied performed during World War II. Um, but what he didn't mention is after World War II, there's something called Geneva Con Convention, which defined the action as deliberate targeting of civilians, such as bombing of Dresden and fire bombing of Tokyo as war crimes. So back in World War II, that's, yes, that's what people did. But after World War II, it was very clearly written what is war crime. And Israel today is committing war crime. And there's no, you know, there's no if and buts about it. And 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 again, the, the the people like you earlier talk about all these open source intelligence bros on on you know Twitter or whatever. They're they're trying to oh you know look at this military hardware and try to come do a matchup of both sides. It's like those nerds doing like the baseball trading baseball cards, right? But this is a serious war on the ground, and it's not a a, a war of equals. It's a it's a it's a occupying power. And, and the oppressed people finding fighting the oppression, and by the same logic of the is uh, IDF, when they say, "Oh, you know, this collateral damage happens because we are trying to get to to Hamas," uh, and, and that you know, it's really on Hamas that that all these dead happen, uh, that, you know, caused by our bombing. You know, if you apply to the same logic to, uh. You know, the Hamas Aqsa flood. Then, then that's just justified too. There are, there, you know, you you can't you can't have it both ways. You can't have your cake and eat it too. And and again, this is, it's not even the two are not morally equivalent because Israeli is the one that's occupying the Palestinian territory, and they don't have any legal standing um, to bomb to 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 commit the war crime that they do. And and so this is uh, just to go back. You want me to talk about kind of the you know the guerrilla warfare uh, pioneer by by Mao um, during World War II. You know, the, the Imperial Japanese Army they are um, you know they're so much uh, has much superior firepower than the than than China because China at that time was still a agrarian a largely agrarian country. Um, that's unable to, for most part, couldn't produce its own uh, own military needs, and and so what China had to do was trade territory, trade space. Uh, I mean, luckily, unlike Palestine, China is quite large, so they they could trade space and and draw the Japanese occupier further inland, and then and then attack their supply lines, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's, it's a little bit different from Palestine because the, the, the area of Palestine is quite small and, and, and Gaza, as many rightfully point out, is the world's largest open air prison. So Israel is bombing one of the world's largest, high, most densely populated area. It's, it's bombing a, a, a prison, right? I mean, with, with people nowhere to run. And, and so, um, you know, yeah, it, it's uh, it's it's not the the Israeli action and the Palestinian reaction. They're not they're not morally equivalent, and that's this uh, it, it, it's facetious to 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 make that claim. I think um, people. I am sweating bullets right now because I'm in Bali <laughs> and uh, I, I'm not having a right now because our our electricity went out. So. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, this is uh, it's it's, it's um, but you so you it, just, just go ahead when you said you, you were talking about space and trading space, and uh, you know, in, in Gaza, they obviously don't have the space to trade, but um, you know, they have. I mean, they have things that China didn't have, right? Too like they have. It's it's just a different situation. They're mu they're much closer to. They can reach with rockets. You know, China wasn't going to reach Japan with rockets. Um, you know, they, they have tunnels. So there there's a lot of different things in each situation. But like the the way Mao talked about it was so um, like he has these general principles, right? And so it's sort of like. You know, when they're when they're retreating, we follow. When they're attacking, uh, we retreat. When so, like it's those those ones. And I remember a, a while ago, you and I talked about Palestine, Carl, before, and you were saying that that Palestinian guerrillas actually trained um, in China. So, like yeah. a, a little bit about. Do you want to just talk a bit about that? And Arama pulled a book, so I think Arama. <laughs> I, I was born, uh, uh, I mostly born and raised in China in the decade of 80s. And in 1980s, China actually didn't recognize Israel. It was the only recognized Palestine. Uh, uh, China only normalized ties with Israel, I think, after, after 1992, um, like uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. But uh, I remember on TV, you know, there's many visits by Palestinian delegations uh, headed by uh, Arafat. You know, every he will appear on the Chinese state television so often, and uh, they actually or the um, the Palestinian de um, de delegations they will visit um, some of the old um, the old communist bases in China. And I remember one of one of the Palestinian delegate, um, he he made the remark that, you know, if we fought, if we had um, made the made the sacrifice like they did, um, the Palestine would be free. I mean, I, I think he was paying compliment to his Chinese host, but I think he's also, uh, you know, you know, you know referring to to the, 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 the situation in the Palestine, kind of the frustration he must have felt with um, with the continual Israeli occupation. And um, so, yeah, in, in, but be, before before decade of 80s, you know, before I was born you know, throughout 60s, 70s, Mao China was one of the biggest supporters of the Palestine uh, Palestinian resistance. Um, they uh, this, it's, 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 this is well documented, and and this is why during eighties, even after uh, Mao passing away, uh, Yasser Arafat continued to visit China very frequently and receiving support there, um, because there's a I think there's a natural affinity for the Chinese people um, uh, of the chi Chinese people for the Palestinian cause because they also understand the cost of the occupation and resistance. Um, in face of an uh, overwhelming uh, uh, well-armed enemy, you know, it's because China lived through between eight, 14 to eight years of Japanese occupation. It depends whether you're Manchuria or the rest of the China, and and it was is quite brutal. But uh, the the. I mean, it's it's it the, the the at the time it was quite clear. Also, you know, Israel was aligned with. Apartheid South Africa, you know, all the Euro suspects. <laughs> and before that, Rhodesia too, you know, and then now now Zimbabwe. And and so so you know it's it, Israel was not a was not the good guy. And 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 then um I think what changed uh in 1990 uh is because uh, China was under diplomatic isolation. Um, after 1989 student uh, protest, Tiananmen Square student protest. So, so China launched a, a diplomatic offensive after that. So in 1990, that's when China started to establish diplomatic ties with a lot of the formerly anti-communist countries like Indonesia and then South Korea, 
uh, Malaysia, Singapore, and then later Saudi Arabia and Israel. Um, uh, that that all happened around the same time. But China has always voiced uh, support for <clears throat> the establishment of Palestinian statehood. Um, you know, Xi Jinping has said that the only only path uh, to peace is for the two state solution. But what happened is. Israel is really do not want to stay solution. No. And the, the Israeli action in the past um, 30 years in, uh, is really killing off the state solution, two state solution where it's no longer possible because they want, like Netanyahu said, he wanted greater Israel, except, uh, you know, he, uh, you know, he want his own river to the sea. He want the, all, all of the Palestine to be Israel, but except he, they, they can't give equal rights to the Palestinian living there because that would mean the end of the Jewish state. And, and because there's an equal number of J uh, Jews and Palestinian living within that that border. Um, so so we are we're looking at a, a explicitly um, apartheid system um, that's designed to keep Palestinian as less than even second class citizens because they don't yeah. they they don't have the rights uh, they don't have the rights they can um anywhere they go uh just to leave their home they have to go through series of checkpoints and and, and facing this daily humiliation and and this um i mean just to relate kind of the, the chinese experience uh, i know anecdotally my grandfather um, my grandfather lived through Japanese occupation and the Japanese occupying army, they set up checkpoint at every, um, uh, so at the time, all, most of the old Chinese cities have city, city walls. So, so they would, the Japanese would set up check at the city gate. Because my, my grandfather, he lived outside the city, but he traveled, his, he has a clinic inside the city. So he, Every day for work, he has to go through the checkpoint. And the Japanese soldier required all the Chinese people passing through to salute them. And, and my grandpa decided, uh, he, 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 he pretended he didn't hear, hear that and he tried to go through. Like he would stop and, and to punish him, the, the, the Japanese soldier at the checkpoint slapped him. Uh, as punishment, uh, it, it's it's a big humiliation for my grandfather. That's why he um, after this incident, he went out and seek out the, the underground resistance. Um, and and so this is uh, so so th this is what I'm trying to uh, say is for many Chinese people who understand their own history, they have a natural sympathy for what Palestinian people are going through right now. I don't know, what was the book you picked up there? <laughs> oh. <laughs> what were you going for? oh, yeah, no, it's just um, what Carl was talking about was um, making me think of kind of what happened after those major battles um, that I was talking about. So the Battle of Waraka was kind of the what we called like Riwi's last stand, you know, it was um, one of the last kind of large open kind of battles that took place. Um, and what, um, you know, my people in Taranaki then moved to was guerrilla warfare. Um, and because following those battles, they then um, used that to justify the confiscation of our lands because we were in rebellion because we wouldn't sell our lands to them. So um, uh, as they started confiscating more and more and more land, um, one of our leaders, Titoko Waru, um, kind of embarked on this campaign to try to negotiate peace. So he's going around all the different kind of nations in the area, um, speaking to all the top kind of officials there representing the crown. Um, and through just a really heroic effort, um, he finally got to the point where he realised these people don't view us as human. I don't know if he would have expressed it in quite that way, but he realised these people are not negotiating in good faith. Um, there's actually nothing we can do. They'll say one thing, but I think he realized that the goal was always to eliminate us and take all of our lands. And so he moved to um, guerrilla tactics and he did this with his um, elite fighting force, which was called the Takomarua, meaning the 12. So there was this idea of this elite force of 12. It was, in fact, more more than that, but, you know, maybe 12 at a time. And they, um, they would attack um, settler houses um, and they 
created so much fear that all of the settlers um, from Taranaki down to Whanganui, which is quite a large area of the North Island, fled um, and and sought refuge in, in Wellington. Um, and it is kind of um, talked about as being a moment where we actually came very close to completely changing the course of our history um, because he came so close to, to victory there. But but one kind of thing that you can see um, happening there is is just this uh, the use of like provocations to try to entice the the superior forces to to attack uh, in in areas that are more favorable to you. And um, I, I pulled out a book. This is just um, I think this is one of the ones that you read. Yeah, um, yeah. I was I was just looking for a quote um, which I didn't find, but I, I think I can remember the key parts. Which um, so he sends this letter. So he wants them to attack in this area that he like he's he's created all of these traps and all of these um, hiding places um, for his people to to hide in. And he issues this letter and he knows that they have dehumanized us. Uh, he knows that they are calling us rebel, which was, you know, terrorist back then. Um, and that one of the things that they um, hated most about us, that they would use, that they would weaponize against us was this idea of us being cannibals. And so he issues this letter to the crown and he says, you know, cease traveling on all of the roads. And then he starts talking about cannibalism and he he says, my throat is always open for the taste of European flesh or something <laughs> like this. And then says, uh, um, let's see. Yeah. and ends yeah. it with, I shall not die. I shall not die when death itself is dead. I shall be alive. And it was just this like really powerful, um, just something that the the occupiers could not tolerate. And so they did, they, they attacked his position and it was a, a major victory for Te Toko Waru. Um, but, you know, I think I think that's kind of how it played out. Um, and then after that, we, um, after his campaign failed, we moved to, um, I guess, non-violent resistance. So we had um, some religious leaders uh, of the Pai Māori Day faith, uh, and they their tactics were to pull out the survey pegs, to put up fences on lands that were theirs, but were not recognised as their, theirs anymore. Um, so they staged this massive non-violent passive resistance that actually inspired other um, others to follow. So like Gandhi apparently was very aware of the tactics that were used and inspired by that. Um, and then that culminated in, they established this vi village where called Parihaka, where all of the kind of refugees from the area went to. And then um, finally that was invaded by um, the the colonial forces, but also the militias in the area, settler militias. So they invaded this peaceful settlement um, they wanted to be our people wanted to be very clear that we were not going to fight. And so they uh, at, in the space outside of the meeting house, they assembled the women and children. And we were accused of using human shields, you know, at that point as well. Um, and so they they invaded the village and they committed all sorts of atrocities um, and imprisoned the men, raped the women, occupied it for a long time as well. Um but yeah, I think like I, I I'm just sharing this to kind of this is the type of history that that we share to really emphasize the point that we we try everything, you know, you try yeah. all of these different tactics and colonialism never stops. And so we have to um yeah, we have to assess the actions that are taken based on um all the tactics that have been tried and have failed because um like Gandhi, no, sorry, like um Nelson Mandela says it's like your enemy will will decide what when you're a freedom fighter it is your enemy that determines the tactics that you will use that you will be forced to use. Yeah, and I mean, I I, I think I mentioned in the episode we did uh, in the Civilizations uh, podcast about that war about how that like that case you mentioned is like should be one of the cases where it's like don't do nonviolence, you guys. Like, nonviolence is not. Like, you know, this is what happens. And it's like, Palestine has one of those too, right? 2018, the Great March of Return, impeccable nonviolence, absolutely textbook, impeccable, mass, nonviolent action. They marched to the fence. They had, you know, they were ready to melt the hearts of their oppressors and their oppressors just picked them off. Like, like just snipers, they shot, they killed hundreds of people. They permanently wounded. They took, tro they had trophies. They bragged about like being able to take shots of joints and cripple people's knees and and 
Yeah, it was one of the most vile things, like, you know, since the, until now, <laughs> like, since the previous vile thing and until the next one. So, yeah, it's amazing how, um, yeah, how these things come up, like how this nonviolent struggle comes up and it's completely, um, you know, it's just taken adva full advantage of by the violent colonizers and then erased from history. Like, you know, they won't, uh, pe people will now today be like, why didn't Hamas try nonviolence? It's like, Hamas did nonviolence. They did nonviolence in 2018. Um, yeah, but yeah, and I would say like, it's not about like, because that's the problem, eh, is that some people say, oh, no, I'm against violence or, yeah. uh, or I'm all for it. But but it's like, you know, when it, when we say by any means necessary, yeah. you don't know what means are necessary until you've tried the alternatives, you know, and it's yeah. like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. Um, I know Carl has to go not too, too soon. I, 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 I'm, uh, I'm on mute. I'm on mute. Um, so let, let's not forget that during the struggle to end apartheid in South Africa, um, you know, the ANC was condemned by many Western media for committing violence. Uh, and, and they say, oh, how, how can you how can you, uh, you know, commit violence? Yet you are not condemning the violence that's committed by yeah. the occupant, by the the, the the colonial forces. I mean, it's it, it, this is bogus. It's a it's a it's it, you know it, same thing right now. The, the mainstream media uh, plus the, the the American government and all its vassal states say Israel has a right to defend itself. Well, what about Palestinians? All right. Yeah. I mean, I mean the the, the, it's, it's the Palestinians has been brutalized for the last 75 years. Enough is enough. Um, the, the the cannibal thing, <laughs> I hadn't heard that out of my, I don't think, or if I had heard it, I didn't remember it because that's, that's actually very interesting because it kind of makes me think of, um, you know, the, the red arrow, the red triangle videos <laughs> that we've been seeing where it's like, um, and, but, but it also reminds me of, um, like the way that Israel's propaganda and like the pro-Israel propaganda responded to October 7th, um, you know, with like really lurid, really, really horrific stories that, you know, didn't actually turn out to have evidence behind them. It's also like, it's interesting because like if their plan is to uh reestablish those settlements close to gaza uh, like you really have scared people a lot so it's like are people gonna want to go back <laughs> you know like this is the horrible horrible things that happened to people who lived there just because they were there can you believe it now would you mind going back there and uh resettling that that land like i don't I, this is why I, I wonder, like, you know, I've always hated the idea of, like, a quagmire. I don't really, like, that's not one of my, the concepts. I, I think, like, the idea that, like, oh, the U.S. has stumbled into a quagmire and now they can't figure out a way out of it. Like, I think that's kind of often an excuse for colonizers or imperialists to be like, we, well, we're in a quagmire. I guess we have to stay. But, like, with Israel right now and and the way that, it looks it doesn't like it doesn't look to me like they really have a plan it's like okay they're gonna expel everybody and send them to the sinai and then what are those people gonna just relax in the sinai right like you know they're not gonna relax in the sinai they're, and and the egyptian one of the egyptian um officials said that he was like yeah we're gonna let them into the sinai somebody from the Sinai is going to send a rocket into Israel and then Israel's going to attack us too. Like, no, thank you. So Egypt was like, we're not, we're not on board with that solution. Uh, Cause that's not going to work for us. And so they're like, we're just going to expel everybody or they're going to what they're going to kill everybody in Gaza. And then, and then what do they do with the West bank? And what do they do with Lebanon? Like they're going to kill everybody everywhere all the time forever. So uh, it does seem a little quagmire-like, actually, when you think about it that way. 
right? If you think about it, you know, like you, when you talk about the settlers fleeing uh, yeah. the, 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 the strip around Gaza, I actually saw people interviews of the, the settlers from those settlements. They say, oh, well, we're never going to go back. We're never and going back. Yeah. We're never going to go back. And, and the, there was the, the an fact interview. Is, yeah, there was an interview the, the of people who flew to the U.S. They were like, we're not going back to the envelope. We're not going back to Israel. We're done. We're done. Yeah. That That's the thing. The, these people have options. They have yeah. options to flee to United States, whereas the Palestinians are being evicted from their homes. They have nowhere to go. And and they, you know, the, 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 the occupier always say, oh, why don't the Arab countries accept them? Why don't they go to the Arab countries? Why should they leave their home and go to a go to foreign land? And, and you, you know, coming from from Brooklyn will take take the, over their house. I mean, that's ridiculous. But most Israelis have. Uh, dual citizenship, and they have additional passport. They have options. They have places to go. They have. They can just go to go return to United States. Uh, the Palestinians don't have that luxury. They they are fighting for their homes, and and you know the the the, the, the people living in Gaza. They are the ones who survived the first Nakba back in 1948 when they were evicted from the from the other parts of Palestine, and. And so, I mean, the, I, I think you, I, I think in this case, precisely because the sellers have the other options, I don't, I don't, I don't think, um, you know, for first, I agree with you. All this quagmire talk is just shirking responsibility. How somehow the empire always stumble, stumble. stumble. They always stumble. make a mistake. It's always a mistake, or somehow they they stumble. No, they they actively pursue policies that had disastrous consequences. And, and to cover up for what they did, they say, "Oh, sorry, we we stumble into Iraq." No, you 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 plan, you plan for the Iraq invasion. Invasion it just didn't go the way you wanted it. And 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 talking about the Israeli plan, I think you know part of Netanyahu's uh, uh, support base. They do want to, you know, ethnically cleanse the rest of Palestine. But again, like you said, where's the settlers going to come from? Who, 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 who from Brooklyn right now want to go move to Gaza? And, and I, you know, I, I and, and the only thing that made it the Gaza unpalatable for them is precisely the violence waged by Hamas against the settlers. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's, 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 how, how do you wage nonviolent resistance when your uh, enemy has tanks and airplanes and, you know, they have they control everything and they control the media as well <laughs> and all the politicians in their pockets? Well, um, we are almost at the end of our time. We will continue our caucusing once again, um, but uh, you know, I, I when I think about, I, I just want to kind of give you the last word, Arama, because when I think about like, when I, because because Carl, you mentioned you know how China normalized in 1992, and of course they normalized in 1992 because Oslo happened, and when the Palestinians signed a deal, China's not going to be like, sorry, we're going to be more Palestinian than than Arafat. Right? If Arafat signed, how could China hold out? Right? But it's like um, that that like uh, forcing you to sign something is actually a lot more important than I think Israel today realizes, where the, Israel's got this like we don't care, we don't want it a surrender, we don't accept anything. We're just gonna bomb and bomb and kill and kill until what until you know forever i don't know and so it's like the role of the treaty the role of like the agreement that's sort of like imposed and like the ability to recruit some layer of leadership you know to co-opt them is so important to colonialism and that's like I don't know, that's what seems to have been abandoned. That's what Israel seems to have just given up on, which I don't think bodes well for them. And I guess, like, I guess, like, that's kind of like what I wanted to ask you about, Arama, because I feel like that's, you know, that's like one of the stories of like settler indigenous warfare 
where like the treaty and the legal part is also part of the warfare. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So yeah, after we staged the kind of nonviolent re resistance, that was kind of seen as the final nail in the coffin of the transfer of sovereignty to the crown. And since mm -hmm. then, it's just been lawfare, lawfare, lawfare to continue to take whatever resources that we have. And, and that's because of the internal contradictions of capitalism, which require these settler colonies to always be expanding. And so Israel doesn't have a long-term plan. They're just, I guess, trying to solve the immediate internal conflict within their own society. And the only way to do that is, is to have an external enemy and to expand. Um, and it is never ending. It is, yeah. it is forever greedy. Um, but in terms of um, pathways forward, um, I, I listened to a speech made by uh, Representative uh, Melanie, I think her name is, for, from the Red Nation at the March on Washington, and I thought that was so powerful. Um, and, you know, she used imagery of the, the, I think she said something like, the 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 siege has been broken and the wagons are burning, you know, which is just so incredibly powerful. And, and she kind of, uh, I guess she had the same idea as Scott Ritter when he said that Hamas don't have to win, they just have to survive um, because the resistance is never ending. Um, and um, yeah, and and the, the the that speech at, at the March on Washington talked about about that idea of 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 knowing that the Palestinian struggle will never end because we are here and we remain and we continue that struggle um, here in Aotearoa. We've just elected a horrendous government that will be coming for our treaty white rights but in a way i'm i'm i'd rather deal with somebody who says it to my face you know um and it's going to be on we're in for a a big ride over the next three years but but for us we will be returning to the treaty as as a, a as something that doesn't is not where our rights are derived from but it reasserts and reaffirms our our rights and provides a framework for other people to be on these lands because you know when we want Sinoranga te Tanga, we're not asking to expel all yeah. non-native people um just as Palestinians are not calling for the expulsion uh of non-Palestinians or non-Arab which you shouldn't even have to say <laughs> yeah <laughs> like... right yeah. <laughs> but yeah um, okay, thank you guys. Thank you for this caucus. We will caucus again, uh, maybe on this topic or maybe uh, back to our normal um, Indo-Pacific strategic discussions that we... <laughs> as long as it takes. As long as it takes. <laughs> Until we're all free. <laughs> Until we're all free.